Last week, my niece, Amy, told me that she had a very deep and profound conversation with her daughter, 11-year-old Charlotte. The conversation was about a lot of the issues that we are experiencing, not only in this country, but around the world, particularly issues like Black Lives Matter. My grandniece, 11-year-old Charlotte, wrote this poem after that conversation with her mother. I want to share it with you. I think the moon can teach us a lot about justice. The moon is different colors. Sometimes it is skinny, and sometimes the moon is fat. Sometimes it's black, and sometimes the moon is white. Sometimes the moon is all mixed up with different colors, like during an eclipse. And yet, we don't judge it for who it is. We just live with it. I think the moon can teach us a lot about justice. Each one of us has been affected in some way, I'm sure, by the COVID-19 virus, and it's not over. The more recent protests and rallies occurring everywhere around the world have reawakened in us a sense of this racial injustice that has been simmering for a long time. These experiences urge you and me to think about what really matters in our lives and the lives of other people as well. Obviously, our youngsters, our teenagers, like my grandniece Charlotte, they are pondering the same issues. They're wondering what's in store for them as they graduate from high school. Will there be jobs after graduating from college? And so forth. A lot of people are pondering what is it that really matters in our lives. Over the past three months, you and I have received an awful lot of, it seems, <laughs> never-ending information on, on the virus, and very strong statements and actions regarding what divides us in this country. Sometimes the news is overwhelming, and sometimes the news is conflicting. You don't know what to believe anymore sometimes. History reminds us that lives are changed by human events, whether it's a war, a pandemic, a financial crisis, civil unrest, or travel to the moon. For us gathered here in this church and for those of you who are participating with us using social media, we must also look to the importance of the Bible, God's word. And sometimes we lose sight of it because of all the commotion that is going on around us. We forget about how God continues to speak to us and how God wants us in some way to answer, to reply. When we think about the Bible, we see that it too was full of difficult events, floods, droughts, exiles, plagues, and tribal wars, people divided even amongst themselves. How did the people manage to survive in those times? How do you and I manage to survive today? The scriptures tell us inspiring stories about ordinary people, ordinary people like you and me, and how they have done wonderful things in history, just like many of you, I'm sure, are doing wonderful things today to ease the burden of those who are suffering more than we are because of the virus or because of the issues that divide us. The important thing for us then is to See what it is about this unnamed woman in the first reading. She's a good example of an ordinary person doing something about injustice. She practiced radical hospitality by offering a room in her house to the prophet Elisha, whose name means, my God is salvation. 
The woman's action was a bold one. Why? Because the cultural background for the Book of Kings, which is that first reading, was very patriarchal. The social, political, and religious climate at that particular time shaped the role of women whose value was usually measured only by their ability to have children. The Shunammite woman broke that mold. And perhaps if she were here with us this morning, she too would be singing, all are welcome in this place. How bold are we? How bold are you and I in breaking down any cultural system that treats people unfairly? It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do something about it. How do you and I welcome and relate to others from different races, different creeds, different nationalities, especially those people who show up unexpectedly and have very special needs, like they're hungry or homeless or jobless? This is the question that biblical scholar John Pilch and others raise for you and for me today on the 13th Sunday of ordinary time. Can anything be ordinary again? The first and Old Testament prophet like Elisha talked about better days ahead for those who believe in God as we do. And in the New Testament, the teacher Paul suggests, and this is sometimes hard to understand, that suffering and dying must happen before we can rise up again to new life. But when you stop and think about it, that's what Christianity is based on. If you ponder the crucifix, we believe that Jesus conquered suffering and death to rise up again. And so must we, especially in these times of suffering and turmoil and death and dying. One of the important things for us to understand is in that second reading, and the reference to baptism is found in the words of the scholar Israel Kamuzandu. And he said, we have to remember that baptism is not a one-time event when the water is poured over our body. Rather, baptism is a long, lifelong process of transformation and growth and renewal. Baptism is just the beginning of a life where you and I are responding to God's call trying to figure out how to do whatever we do better and to do it better so that other people can enjoy the fruits of the world that God gave us. Our salvation does depend on God's grace and the good work that we do here on earth. Want to be saved? Bless God, thank God, but then do something for someone else. In the gospel, Jesus' mission discourse calls you and me to be heralds of good news. And if we accept that we have been called by God to do something, then we're going to do something great. We're not going to complain. We're not going to feel sorry for ourselves. We're just going to try to do something good today. And if we believe that all people are created by God, then we must respect and accept everyone in the world as equals to us. God didn't create some people more important than others. And in this sense, then you and I become channels of peace. We become bright lights to the world. However, this gospel can be confusing. If you were listening to it carefully, as I try to over and over again, it says, in order to find our lives, we have to lose our lives. Now, what does God mean by that? What did Jesus mean that I have to leave my mother and father, my brother and my sister? I love my brother and father, my mother and sister. I don't have to leave them behind. So we misunderstand that. His instruction, Jesus' instruction, does not require us to leave family and friends, does not ask us to give up absolutely everything we've accomplished in the world, no. Rather, we are called to focus more emphatically on what it means to live by Christian principles and values. It could mean, it could mean that we have to give up some non-essential attachments that we 
come to light in this world. We then use our talents and resources, our relationships and connections to advance peace and justice for all people. So finally, we recall then the Shunammite woman in the first reading. She was kind and welcoming to others without asking for anything in return. She took risks to do so. And Paul, in the second reading, reminds us of our baptismal call to make a difference in the world. And Jesus, in the gospel, taught us how to be compassionate to one another, especially our children. And, according to my great-grandniece, Charlotte, the moon, too, can teach us a lot about justice.